we're continuing with the book of James, and if we remember the context, uh, what James is, is a letter, right? James is a letter to a group of people, and these are Jewish Christians who are scattered around the Roman Empire. These aren't uh, Christians who live in Jerusalem, but all around. And they're facing trials and temptations and persecution even. So James tells them that they should count it joy when they encounter troubles because it's testing their faith. It leads them to be steadfast and strong and grows their faith so that they become strong and mature. Then he goes on, as we have recently looked at, to say, okay, now that you've got this faith, what does it look like? If you say you're religious, but it's all talk and no action, then it's worthless. Right? So James uh, told us last week, we looked at, what is religion? For James, it was doing what you say you're going to do. It was loving people with the love of Jesus, not in word, but in word and in deed. And he talked about taking care of the widow and the orphan, people who in his day and in ours don't have the ability to take care of themselves often. People the world has passed by, people who aren't successful or rich, but people who need God's people to go to them and help them and love them. So today we look at uh, what he continues to say. Apparently in the churches he's writing to, people were uh, distinguishing based on how rich people were. Now that thankfully doesn't happen much in our churches today and we're kind of beyond the point of dressing up in our Sunday best and uh, poor people may not have the ability to buy any fine clothing to go to church. Thankfully that time has passed but apparently in James's day, there was this partiality. People were treating each other differently based on how much money they had. Do you know in the church's history, um, it almost seems crazy that most of the time no one wants to go to church, but it used to be that people rented pews. Right? They used to pay money to have the good seat, where the Boy Scouts are sitting, where nobody likes to sit. People would pay a lot of money to sit there a long time ago, because that's where you can look the most religious. You can really make a name for yourself in the community as a stand-up citizen. Again, thankfully those times are over, and all of you come not to be seen, but to praise God. But even in this early time, things weren't always the best in the church. These Christians were struggling with a change of identity, See, money and riches, that's an identity we have, right? We call somebody poor, and that makes up their identity. We call them homeless, and that makes up their identity. Or we think of the rich, and we treat each of those people differently because of what they have. See, the rich find their joy, their security, their whole identity in money and in possessions. But you know, we fool ourselves often when we think that the number is important, right? We, we think the number is important. We marvel that people once upon a time were paid 10 cents an hour to work, or that milk cost five cents a gallon. But those numbers aren't really that meaningful, right? Because uh, we know about inflation. We know that the number is a relative figure, right? It's not about the number you have, but how much you have in comparison to somebody else. That's what gives you power. If you had a thousand dollars a hundred years ago, that's a lot of money. Now it isn't. But how much power do you have to buy, to be respected, to, um, to make your will be done? See, money is all about how much we have in comparison to our competition which is everybody else, right? It's a way that we can show that we're better than someone else or have them treat us differently. Money only is valuable because it's unequal, right? If it were equal, money would have no value. It's all about competition. So having riches, as James is saying, 
is the, the rich people in his day are oppressing the poor. Why is that? Well, it's because the rich people have money because the poor don't. The rich people have power because the poor don't. So having riches, even for the nicest people and the most sincere, being a rich person is about finding your identity and being better off than someone else. What kind of an identity is that? But it's not just about riches, that's what James is talking about. There's partiality of many other kinds. What's so bad about partiality? Well, we have politics today and becoming increasingly an issue. I've seen commentators saying that the right and the left in America have never been further apart. There's never been a greater chasm between political opinion. How many times have you seen or I seen a bumper sticker that's all about hate? Hatred of a person or another party as though what you vote defined everything, whether even you should live or die. It's really quite a terrible thing. But another factor in our society increasingly is age and generations. We distinguish and discriminate and show partiality to people based on their age. Do you show favoritism based on how old someone is? We know in our society that being young is very important, and yet sometimes many of us still look down upon the young. Paul says to Timothy, uh, the guy who was training up for ministry, he said, don't let anyone look down upon you because of your age. See, our society doesn't respect old age either anymore. So we like to uh, distinguish amongst ourselves and show partiality. But why is partiality so bad? After all, isn't it about just birds of a feather flocking together? See, partiality is self-love. It's about loving ourselves, but it's a self-love that's built on hate, right? When we say, I like myself and I like you guys because, wow, look, we're all white in this room. Aren't we all the same race? Isn't that great? What's wrong with that? Well, by identifying ourselves that way, now we've made other people who aren't like us to not be so great. We've distinguished amongst ourselves and shown partiality based on things that we think are important. And it never happens that we want to hate other people. Rich people aren't usually rich because they hate poor people. That's not how it works. But it's about how we build our identity. Do we build our identity by looking at others and saying, yeah, I'm not like you, I'm not like you, I'm better than you. Uh, that group, they're not they're no good. Uh, you know, I would never vote like those idiots. I wouldn't, you know, those, those people who support the Panthers are insane, right? Partiality is built on loving ourselves. But it's, it's this image of ourselves we've made up for ourselves. And we make it up by putting others down. This is the anti-gospel. James is saying this, this goes right to the heart of what Jesus Christ is all about. Jesus, who is God, who came to love his enemies, to love those who didn't love him, to those who love themselves but not God and do not love others. That is who God is, one who pursues people, pursues people to love one another. See, the gospel is that God does not show partiality based on how we define ourselves. God doesn't respect the identities we make up for ourselves. There's gender, there's race, there's sexual orientation, wealth, education, political beliefs, nationality, sports teams. All of these things have no place in a relationship with God. Paul says it this way, in Christ there is no male or female. Right? He doesn't say there's both male and female, so let's celebrate. He says, in Christ, there is no male or female. You can't say, I'm a man, so I'm better than women, and Jesus is there to support me. No, in Christ, there's no male or female. In Christ, there's no Jew or Greek. There is no race in Christ. 
We're not going to celebrate the, the diversity. We're saying we're celebrating our unity in Christ. These things pass away. Jew or Greek, slave or free, our economic status. I mean, how much would you resent someone if you were a slave and your master? How much would you hate them for what they do to you and your family? And yet Paul says in Christ, in Christ there is no slave and there is no free. There's no rich or poor. See, Jesus didn't die for this or that group. This was the problem with the Jewish people in the New Testament. They kind of thought they were special and nobody else was. The gospel is that Jesus came for all people, and that's what Paul spends more than half of his time combating, is this Jewish idea that they are the only important people. Jesus died for all people. He died for people as individuals, as you as, and me. He calls you by name. So how can we choose to love, uh, who to love and not love based on the things that we construct, based on the things we think are important when God does not respect those things? Paul says it that way, God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't respect those identities we make. We can't get God's respect. That's kind of a silly idea. Instead, God calls us to follow Jesus to the cross, to die to ourselves, to die to ourselves. I mean, think about what that means, those identities we made up for ourselves, whether we're the victim or the victor, whether we're winner or loser, whether we're rich or poor, in Christ, the good news is none of that matters because God loves you as you are. And he loves all of us as we are. And he asks all of us to love one another in that same way. So what do we do with this teaching of James? Well, see, the only way to combat partiality is with the love of Jesus. We have an alternative way in our world today called political correctness, right? We can try to be politically correct and nice to people, but that's not quite the same thing. If you hate political correctness, then love your enemy. That's the solution. And who do you look at and immediately dislike? I confess that happens to me. It happens to all of us. We just see somebody and immediately we dislike them. Those are the people that we need to reach out to, to tear down the divisions that we've built. What barriers do you put up for people to become Christians or come to church? We all do it. I mean, we see somebody and we get suspicious. Oh, they're not one of us. They're not one of our kind. Why are they here? We think these things even if we don't say it. Our task today is to begin tearing down these walls we built in church and in our lives by finding people that we don't know that well, some, someone who's probably pretty different than you. And as I've said before, take them out to a meal. This is what Jesus did. He had a reputation of eating with tax collectors and sinners, right? These are the people the Jews didn't like. They don't like Jesus because he's transgressing these boundaries that they set up. Who are the tax collectors and sinners that we know that need a friend, that need to know that God loves them, even though the world does not? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word in James. Uh, always challenging us to look hard at the way we treat others and whether we say think one thing and do another or whether we look at ourselves in a mirror and forget immediately afterwards what we look like. Lord, give us constancy and courage to love those that we would never love because that's what you've done for us. We pray that you would make your gospel real in our lives, that you would give us a new identity, 
that we would be born once again in your name as part of your family and not part of the things that we make up for ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.